So what did the Patriots do? Well, they knew that in order to be successful, they were going to need to gain control of the local governments. Because remember that each colony, and even within each colony, um, it was very, very splintered in terms of control. There wasn't much centralized control other than what the Sons of Liberty had been trying to accomplish in Massachusetts. And so ultimately the Patriots are going to work towards establishing more localized, centralized governments that they could kind of coordinate so they could work together in this cohesive war effort. And this is really going to happen uh, through much of 1774 and 1775. And much of this work is going to be done obviously by the men. But at this point, I just wanted to pause for a minute and acknowledge that women, too, were very active in these war efforts. Um, they were the ones left to run the businesses and the, you know, farms and all these different types of things that the men had been doing while the men went off to war or politics. Um, plus, you did have a lot of women who were active in the actual fighting in a variety of ways. Um, sometimes they would dress up um, in you know, 1700s provocative garb and try to distract the British in whatever way possible, or they would spy. Or for their own armies, sometimes they would, you know, they would cook the meals for the soldiers, they would do the dish, the, the laundry and the cooking and the, the cleaning up of the battlefields. Um, they were oftentimes the nurses. And so there was a variety of different jobs that the women did you know, there were cases where the wives followed their husbands off to war in order to continue to tend to their needs. So let's pause and just be like, yay, good job, women. Like, way to keep doing stuff. Um, and so you had a lot of the, these types of, um, you know, all of the American colonists working together for this war effort, not just the privileged white men or the poor white men. Um, women even sometimes went so far as to actually dress up as men to disguise themselves in order to be a more active part in the war effort. Uh, that being said, there were the Loyalists. Okay, we do have to acknowledge that they existed uh, because they did play a very important part in terms of disrupting the work of the Patriots. About a half a million to a million Americans uh, called themselves Loyalists or Tories. Now, when we had the numbers of the Patriots earlier, mind you, those are the ones that were actually armed. Again, here in this case, while well, we're saying, oh, there's a million Loyalists, the Loyalists outnumber the Patriots. Not necessarily, it's, it's hard to say, because a lot of the Loyalists were more on the down low with their support. Um, the British would have called them the Tories. It means robbers. It's a very derogatory term, though it's not used so frequently anymore. Um, a lot of times the Loyalists were those people who had come to the colonies later and so they weren't as established as some of these more historic families that had come over and been here for at this point several generations. Uh, so they didn't feel that, that same fervor of we've been here and we fought for so long and we've built ourselves up from scratch. They were new. They were, you know, oh we, we've come over to see what this new world is like and oh well these guys seem to be overreacting. We're not so sure about them. Only with British accents that I'm not going to try. Um, so you did have these people. Sometimes they were uh, actually sent by the British to come over uh, to hold various low-level positions within the government. Remember, um, one of the uh, intolerable acts was that Massachusetts uh, legislature was to be appointed by the British. And so these guys would obviously be loyalists because they had nice positions with England. So why would they want to split free? Um, and, you know, sometimes they would be, like, people who helped with the charters and maintained the charters on this side of the ocean or those types of things. So there were a lot of reasons why people might be loyalists. Um, and what happened is patriots actually go so far as passing different pieces of legislation that said if they found out that you were a loyalist, that you were going to be put on trial for treason. Uh, they were not messing around. They didn't care about what your point of view was. If you didn't like it here, as far as the Patriots were concerned, get on the boat and go back to England. Don't sit here and be, you know, part of this American war effort if you don't view yourself as American. Um, so there's all sorts of different things that are going to happen. Sometimes there's actually going to be outright violence towards the Loyalists by the Patriots. And, of course, vice versa. Um, but it just tends to be more interesting for a lot of people. Um, patriots are going to punish the Tories, the Loyalists, 
um, by using what's called the Grand Tory Ride. I have a picture on the next slide of this. Um, or by tarring and feather, whereby you would actually take the person and cover them in a hot tar and then dump feathers on them in some way or different pieces of garbage, basically. And not only was it really, really painful, but it was also very shameful. So it was kind of a two-fold tactic of, look at this person. You can't trust them. We're going to shame them into being a part of us. And that doesn't actually usually work very well. One guy who comes into the discussion at this point who's pretty well known is Benedict Arnold. Um, in very early battles of the revolution, Benedict Arnold was a pretty decent, um, I believe he was a general or a colonel, he was really high up in the military, and he was actually a patriot, he was fighting, you know, at times alongside Washington, and he was doing a really good job. And so everybody thought this was all great. But what happened was he, he began to suspect that the Patriot forces were not um, going to win. He didn't think that there were um, wise strategy techniques being made. Just a variety of reasons um, that he basically becomes a paid informer to the British General Henry Clinton. So he's now getting paid at this point to continue to be a Patriot, but to spy on them in his position and report back to Clinton what he saw. Um, he was found out within a few months. By 1780, the Patriots found out that he was doing this. Uh, they're actually going to put him on trial for treason. Uh, he becomes actually synonymous with treason within the U United States. You know, um, a lot of times people are like, "Oh, you're just a Benedict Arnold. You gave up on this. You gave up on her cause, and you turned your back on us, and that's just not okay." Uh, and ultimately, he's going to flee to London, where he winds up. Um, eventually, he he dies after the war. Um, you know, kind of humiliated as far as the Americans are controlled, concerned, the British, they don't dislike him quite as much. Um, but this was just indicative of the British strategy to find the loyalists within the colonies and to rely on them to help them with the British war effort. And about 50,000 loyalists are ultimately going to do this. They're actually going to join in with the British, take arms against their neighbor patriots, and, and engage in this full-on warfare. Um, when patriots would find this out, they would, again, use some form of shamey technique, threatening, um, you know, physical harm and whatever the cases were. They basically were working to drive the loyalists out of the country so that they could then focus their entire efforts against the British. Um, so as a result, you're going to have a lot of loyalists who are going to flee to England, the, Br the British West Indies, Canada, even back to... Um, sometimes Scotland and Wales and Ireland and these types of places as well. So loyalists are slowly going to be driven out of the country. Uh, here you can see this is tar and feathering and then this is the the Grand Tory ride. It's just stringing you up in the town and then usually what happened is all these people would throw some form of garbage at you and obviously scream at you, taunt you and you could stay up there for several days um, in which case you're going to perish. Uh, you could be eaten by different scavenger birds or you know you could dehydrate or run out of food or whatever the case was. So now we have to transition to actually looking at that says the campaign for New York and New Jersey. The actual fighting. Like how is this fighting actually done? Um, throughout much of this discussion you're gonna see I have a lot of battle maps for those of you who are uh, really interested into that uh, in terms of what do I need to know for the AP test. You're not ever going to have to know every single battle. That would be quite a lot to try to learn. Um, but it is important to try to think about the strategy and say, you know, what did the British have going for them? What did the Americans have going for them? And then did we learn anything from these, this war on how to fight wars more effectively? So the earliest campaigns are going to be in the north. In the winter of 1775 and 1776, um, the British are going to have this strategy where they're going to try to basically, you know, I'll use my zip pinch scenario again because that's more or less what they're going to do, um, but they want to basically try to have troops in New York and troops near Canada, and they're going to try to squish the uh, patriots, uh, the colonists, in the middle. Uh, Washington is going to be in the middle. He's the one who's going to pretty much do most of the work for the colonists, uh, and he's going to have set up forts in Brooklyn. Right, so it's right smack in the middle of all this maneuvering that William Howe was working on. In, the July, in July of 1776, we have a huge battle, one of the first. And you could talk about hundreds of battles, mind you. I'm not going into tons of details. You're going to do your little project on some. But, you know, there are tons of battles out there. I'm just picking a couple. 
So in this particular one, you have the Battle of Long Island, um, where Washington is going to be decimated. All right, it's going to be a huge disaster for the Patriots, uh, which ultimately is going to allow the British to uh, take over New York City. And here you can get a rough sense of where the forces were. Uh, you see up here in the key, the black forces or the Germans, those are called the Hessians. Um, what the British did is oftentimes, instead of paying for their own citizens to come over and fight the revolution, they would uh, basically fund German soldiers to come over and do the fighting for them uh, because they could pay them less money. And so whenever you see the Germans, they're fighting against the Patriots. So you got Washington here, here in the middle, and so you got Howe, who's going to be able to sneak up here, right? He's come up this direction. Do, 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 do. I don't know. I'm not going to make sound effects, but you get the idea. Smash the troops that are over here. Meanwhile, they're going to flank this direction, and the Hessians are going to flank this direction. So Washington gets himself, I mean, it doesn't seem like it would be a horrible position, because if uh, these troops had managed to swing downward, if they had anticipated in time, they could have crushed Howe. Uh, but the back line would have been, they would have then been fighting against two different forces here, and that wouldn't have been quite as successful. Here's an incredibly blurry map that shows you essentially the more specific targets with the Americans in blue, and you can see our general uh, path of flee, and then how we're getting attacked on so many different sides by the British, which includes the Hessian forces. On September 6, 1776, uh, a bunch of guys who were originally part of the Sons of Liberty, right? Ben Franklin, John Adams, these guys that we always talk about. Uh, Edward Rutledge is a newer one to our conversation. They're all going to decide, you know what, we're going to lose if we don't try to um, pursue an end to this war. We need to see if there's a way that we can have peace talks because these early defeats are really going to hurt the morale of the Patriots. And so they're going to try to have peace talks with the different Howes who... Uh, happen to be in charge of the British forces. Uh, and ultimately, Admiral Howe is going to say, sure, we'll end the fighting on the condition that you take away the Declaration of Independence. They wanted us to basically undeclare ourselves independent. Uh, that was not going to happen. In order to try to convince us to do that, though, the British are going to invade Manhattan. Um, and the only reason that that doesn't um, completely destroy us uh, is that there's this huge American stand at Harlem Heights, it's coming up, and we are going to manage to recruit some natives to help us out, some of the Iroquois in particular, and this combination is going to be able to make us have like this final stand, although it's obviously not our final stand, where we are going to prevent the destruction of a large part of the Patriot force. Right? We are going to be able to stand there, stand firm, or else we would have been destroyed. Um, and this is what kind of enables us to mock that, pro that proposal by Howe. Uh, but this doesn't stop the British from continuing to advance. So the British are then going to, you know, continue to push uh, Washington all the way back to White Plains. They're going to try to take over a whole bunch of different forts. You could go into, like, all the names of forts. I got Washington up there, Lee up there. There's, there's lots of forts and um, different, you know, Bunker Hill is another important battle and all these types of things. Uh, but the moral of this story is, we saw that we were losing, we said, all right, let's have peace, only if you take away the Declaration of Independence. We're not willing to do that. The British, like, double, triple, quadruple fold their efforts, yet somehow, even though we're still losing battles, we continue to strengthen our resolve to fight forward. And as promised, here's, the, here's a map of one of those, uh, you know, Hudson River battles. Nice squiggly lines in case you like those types of battle maps. Um, all right, so in our next video, we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue the New York and New Jersey campaigns, uh, including this infamous Valley Forge type of thing. All right, stay tuned.